All right, we are back once again, reviewing a recent issue of The Professional Coach, and we are excited to have Pete back with us. You are the uh, number one author in The Professional Coach, it seems like. Every week, we get a, we get a new email and we get a new article written by you. I love it. <laughs> For some reason, two weeks in a row. There we go, man. Yeah. That's great. At the, at the, but they broke they broke that this this week at this the time of this recording I think they just released one uh, with Eric O'Connor a big one yeah Eric yeah. just did the most recent one yeah but, yeah yeah it's good stuff though yeah this is awesome man stoked stoked to have you back everybody loved the last one um so once again we'll be diving into the ask a Qu coach section of this thing this is the professional coach issue that came out on August twenty second it's how to classify assess and coach aging athletes is the title of the uh of the email or of the issue but we are going to dive down into the ask a coach section and the question is how do i effectively cue longtime crossfit athletes who are new to me and i will tell you right off the bat that as a longtime affiliate owner and i say this frequently when i'm talking to people about dealing with athletes I would much rather have brand new athletes that have zero exposure to CrossFit enter my gym than have people with CrossFit experience more often than not. Just because, you know, as kind of stated in this with this question in this article, it can be challenging to coach and deal with somebody who has a different understanding and belief of what CrossFit is to them. Because I think we all have a slightly different idea of what CrossFit is, how CrossFit classes should be run, what coaching looks like, what workouts look like. And so trying to uh, introduce somebody that's not new to CrossFit, but new to the way that you do things into your gym can be a little bit of a challenge. So you experienced the same thing, Pete? A hundred percent. It's, I mean, it's, it's like anything, right? It, it, it's easier to build new habits than break old ones and then rebuild new ones on top of those. So, <laughs> yes. it, you know, it's kind of similar in that sense. Um, starting with that blank canvas so that newer athlete, they're just coming in. They have no idea. They're just like, you know, like they have no idea what CrossFit is. Hey, help me. And you can start from ground zero, um, you know, versus someone who's super confident in what they already know. And if you're right. trying to teach them something new, they could be open to that new thing, but perhaps something you're going to come up with later contradicts something they previously learned, et cetera. So that's where things you start to, you know, potentially have to go down some conversations with them and it takes a little bit more time to, to teach them. Yeah. And I, I, I love in the article that you put the first step in approaching any athlete is to have confidence in your ability as a coach and to show it with each class that you teach. And I think a lot of times I find this not only with new athletes walking into the gym or like uh, new to us athletes, mm -hmm. um, but just coaches that are new coaches in general where they're a little bit nervous, especially if somebody's kind of like grown up being a coach with inside the walls of the gym and they know that some of the athletes in their classes have more experience than them. And so they're a little bit nervous and a little <laughs> bit timid. But to make the point of like, hey, you're the expert, you're leading the class, you need to have confidence in what you're doing, not only coaching like your peers that maybe you've trained with, or if you've got that brand new person that walks in and you, you know, you meet somebody new and they're like, yeah, I've been doing CrossFit for 10 years. And in your mind as a coach, you're like, holy crap, I've only been doing this for three years. I've only been coaching for one year. What am I going to have to offer this individual athlete? Um, so having that confidence is a, is a big piece of this thing, obviously. Totally. And, and you know, confidence is also not cockiness, right? So you should make, we should make that distinction of like misplaced confidence can be a detriment, but where confidence comes from typically as a coach and in, in pretty much everything, actually, you know, especially when you're in a, in a teaching role, your confidence comes from the knowledge you have of the subject matter, right? Or your, your firsthand experiences of whether or not you've had success or failures with the thing you're teaching that individual because just those data points allow you to be confident in your communication with your your athlete as to you know what end point will sort of occur if they head in that direction 
right? You, you, you can say with more or less, higher or lower degrees of confidence, you know, that, you, you know, by doing this, you can achieve X, Y, Z, whether it's, uh, you know, following a program towards a pull-up or, um, you know, coming to class consistency, you know, breeds fitness, at, you know, more of a higher level. Like these, these things just come with experience. So I think that's, that's sort of the first place that people need to look or coaches need to look if they're, if they feel as though they're lacking confidence, right? Everyone's going to have different personalities, but there's things you can do to sort of breed that within yourself. It's, it starts with the knowledge. Yeah. Under, understanding the stuff for sure. And I know, uh, Kristen, you've been coaching for such a long time and, um, have probably had to deal with this same scenario at your affiliate and then in the environment of seminars and getting on seminar staff and things like that. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Oh yeah. I mean, this is the number one question that I had as a new coach. I remember specifically asking this question at my level one, actually, I think it was the only question I asked all weekend was how do you get people that have been coming into the gym just as long as me, or if not longer to listen to me, and who am I to tell them how to do everything? So this is such a common question. And I couldn't agree more with Pete where it starts with just the knowledge and doing the prep work ahead of time and knowing what it is you're going to be teaching and what you're looking for with each movement and having a little bit of a plan, but also just comes with reps, right? Like we can't expect to come into the door day one, month one, month two, and just have the same amount of confidence as somebody that's been coaching for 10 years. I mean, it just takes time, but we just a little bit at a time focusing on one or two small things at a time and gradually that confidence will come. And I think another thing that's really great is that you find the people that are receptive to your coaching and you start to build that confidence based on them. And then you're consistent, you have that credibility. And then other, other members in class will start to see that. And it's just a trickle effect. You know, they'll start to see you uh, coaching and maybe improving movement. And, you know, it's just, it, it's a journey. It's not going to all happen at, at one time in one class. I think like your second point here, Pete, around assuming your members want to be coached. I think that's a lot of times the, the, what causes a lot of the nervousness, right? Is they come in and they're like, oh, you know, this person's been doing it for a while. They probably know what they're mm -hmm. doing. I don't want to offend them by trying to tell them what they should do or what they're doing wrong and make corrections, but assuming positive intent, right? We've heard Todd Woodman say that probably multiple times. We want to assume positive intent. Like somebody comes into the gym, if they're paying me to be a member of my gym, they want to be coached. Like, especially nowadays, anybody can get a workout online and probably go to a facility with the equipment needed to do those workouts. So assuming that somebody wants to be coached and it's, it's cool to see you write this as an athlete who's been doing this for as long as you have at the level that you have CrossFit games level athlete and, and saying that you want to be coached when you are in class. Um, and so I'd, I'd be curious to hear more about that. Have you experienced being in a gym where there's a brand new coach or somebody that is clearly doesn't have the, uh, the amount of experience that you have and you've been simply the athlete. And what was that experience like? Tato Kudo here. I'm one of the coaches on the Knowledge Pro team, and I began CrossFit in 2006, started coaching in 2008, opened my first affiliate in 2011, and got on seminar staff in early 2013. Since then, I've opened an additional affiliate. I've become a CrossFit Level 4 trainer. I've also judged at the CrossFit Games, created content for CrossFit.com, the CrossFit Journal, and all their social media channels, and I've done a lot of things in the space. Now, what I'm really excited about and working on now is creating content for the Knowledge Pro. Now, the Knowledge Pro is this community of coaches that are just trying to push forward and become better themselves and really level up the entire coaching community within CrossFit. Now, the Knowledge Pro has live calls a couple days a week where we can get together, we can discuss topics that are going on in the community and take a deeper dive into the theory behind CrossFit and also practical application drills that we can use to level up our actual coaching on the floor. Now with those specific lessons, you get details on what's important and what, what we can work on to be an above average and, and world-class coach. And then we give you drills to go and practice actually doing those things. Those drills include homework that you're gonna record and bring back to the calls. Then we'll dive into that 
actual homework, watching videos on the call, discussing it, answering questions, giving live feedback. It's a great community for once again, people that just want to be better coaches and want to level up their coaching game. So check it out if you're not already a part of the Knowledge Pro. As soon as you tell yourself in your head as a coach that my members want to be coached, they, they desire that because they paid me the money and they could easily have gone to the global gym down the street and paid a fraction of the price to not be coached and do the same movements. Right? right? You can, there's free workouts on CrossFit.com. They could have just taken it from .com, gone down the street, paid 20 bucks, you know, a month or whatever and not been coached. So it's for them to pay the money and show up to your class, it means they want to be coached. Mm -hmm. And, and I have been in that situation and I've been in that situation where, where people have been too nervous to coach me, even, even within the walls of my own gym, um, you know, people who know me and, but then I've also been in the situation where a, a coach that's more novice than I am ha has given me cues and I've like, I've benefited from that. The bottom line is that when you are working out, you, you can't see the same things as the coach. <laughs> You're focused on other things. You're focused on, you know, maybe you're focused on the pain of the workout. Maybe you're focused on, you know, the one cue that some coach told you last time. And, and now you've forgotten to do this one other thing. And it's jumping out to the, the coach in front of you. That's their opportunity to help you get into a better position for the next lift, right? So there's, there's so many different scenarios that we could, you know, come up with hypothetically where it's just, it's going to be beneficial. And, and you know, so you're right. It is, it is helpful probably for people to know that. And even for you guys as, as super experienced coaches, when you guys are in classes, you guys crave coaching. I'm sure just as much as I do. Hey, like I was just telling you guys, we did the seminar staff summit this week yep. in, in Columbus and like we were just doing PVC pipe and I, I haven't felt my ass. The, that way from people telling me to get in my heels right. and I, I don't know if I felt it in years that way just from just from air squats and deadlifts and, and overhead squats and I was like damn like I, I really need to get in my heels more <laughs> you know yeah, like, I, this is I the, had the same experience really need to get like, in my heels more and, yeah. and that just goes to show you it's such a that's a very you know, that's a basic element to all functional movement. It's a, it's a, it's a common movement thing, posture chain engagement, like dead in your heels. And, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, I, I will never be, none of us will be so advanced that we will outrun the need to right. get a little more in our heels sometimes. And, and if you just, you know, as a, as a novice coach, like, again, just go to the level two, develop the basics of seeing and correcting and then, and try some stuff out like, Hey, get in the heels. Like it can go a long way. Yeah, I think. You know, oh, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say one of the one of the most common questions I seem to get lately with coaches is how to deal with an athlete um, that just doesn't want to be coached, that isn't receptive to coaching. And I think right. one of the pitfalls a lot of coaches potentially can fall into is they maybe do run into that one athlete, right? That one off that is pushes back or isn't receptive, and then unintentionally we start to lump everybody into that category. And then because you had that one experience with that one athlete, now it's this like, Oh, now I'm just, now I just feel hesitant to give anybody cues because now I am assuming that nobody wants to be cued because I had that one experience with that one person where, like you said, Pete, at the end of the day, most people do want to get coached. They're in there to get coached and that's our job is to coach them. So I would, I would also just encourage people if you have had that experience where maybe you, I have, I had, you know, a couple months ago, I tried to give someone a cue and they were basically like, I'm all set. Thanks. Yeah. And I can't, you know, I'm like, all right, got it. And in the moment I have to kind of decide how I'm going to respond to that particular person. But I also have to consciously make sure that I'm not letting that one person impact my, um, just my viewpoint on all the other members that come in. And do you find that you, you see that as well with either of you guys? Yeah, I think, I mean, he, he makes a couple points, good points there. And so do you, Kristen, in the, in the sense that number one with functional movements, no one is ever going to do them perfectly. 
not a thing. Not possible. Nobody's advanced enough to do like <laughs> you've mastered the squat. Not a thing. And so if we think that just because somebody has a ton of experience that they must be doing it right, that's incorrect. Like there is something to be coached on each and every athlete doing each and every movement that they're ever doing. So that's that's one piece of it. I've also it like as you were talking there, Pete, it reminded me of a couple of times where I've been in class and like class finishes and we're doing a movement like hip extensions or something like that. And the coach that was coaching comes up and is like, hey, did I teach that wrong? You were only doing it to where you're like your yeah. shoulder was just below your hip as you were coming up. And I'm like, no, you need to be coaching me. I was doing Tell it me. wrong. You didn't, yeah. <laughs> like you're not teaching it wrong. I'm doing the movement wrong. And it's your job to coach me and call me out for being a bad mover or whatever. Yes. Um, so it's like we we want to be coached. Now, Kristen, to your point of of dealing with those athletes that do push back and are all set and like, I can't tell you how much that makes my blood boil whenever I experience that. Um, and as much as I just want to tell one of those, like if I experience those, those people, or I've seen that happen at like a level two, where one of the seminar staff trainers are coaching athletes in class and they don't respond and essentially tell the, tell the coach, no, thanks. Um, like, this is how I do it. And this is how I do it. It, it makes me want to like kick them out of the seminar, out of the class right there. But, your last two uh, paragraphs in this article, P Pete, show exactly what we should do to approach them. Mm -hmm. Number one, if we've got somebody that's brand new to us but has experience doing this stuff, the wholesale change of essentially telling them that everything they've done up until this point and how bad they suck with their movement, like telling them that by not telling them that, by giving them all the corrections, probably isn't going to go over very well. Right? You're we, looking for a fight. You're looking for a fight. <laughs> yeah, it's like we're going to offend them where it's like, hey, you need to push your knees out and lift your chest up and widen your stance, by the way, and do all this stuff. And they're going to be like, wait a second, I beat you in the workout or whatever. I yeah, must be putting them good. on a like, defensive right away. <laughs> yeah. And so the point of like pick one small thing to work on on day one. And then this last piece, I think is the biggest piece is mm -hmm. give them praise on what they're doing well and start asking those questions to make that connection. It's like, if we don't have a rapport with the athlete, it's going to be a lot harder for us to deliver those cues and corrections and for them to be receptive to it. And so um, it's like, I think we can overcome the majority of those people that push back if we dig in a little bit harder and get to know them more and give them a little bit more of the pats on the back which I'll be honest with you, from my experience is hard to do because when somebody pushes back to me, I just want to say F them and move on to somebody else. And this so. reminds me a little, it's like a little Chuck Carswell nugget, right? Where the more money we can put in the bank and the more rapport we can get with people, the more likely they are going to listen to us when we do have some feedback to give them. So uh, yeah, I, I love this last paragraph so much. It's just give them some praise. There's some people that quite frankly, it's like, you just need to stroke their ego a little bit, like just fluff them up a little bit, give them some attaboys. And then that way, once, once you kind of have that connection with them, it's so much easier to give them that little coaching cue to make them a little better. And then you just, before you know it, it's like three months later, they're coming to you and searching you out to get help on their movement, but you guys start somewhere. Totally. And, and, and it, it stroke their stroke their ego in, in a way that's genuine too, right? Like it's yeah, it's not coming from a place of um, uh, of you know I'm gonna say something through my teeth in order to get you to do what I want. It, it's like find something that you genuinely think they're doing great and let them know about it. I always think of you know how in this situation how would I coach a games athlete if they came into my gym? Clearly, if they're a games mm -hmm. athlete. They will have been moving a certain way for them specifically successful enough to breed world-class fitness. Right. So it's like, what can I bring to the table? Well, obviously ask questions and praise them, but that kind of, to summarize that last paragraph in, in maybe a way that Joe DeGain would put it is, is be curious, right? Mm -hmm. Joe DeGain's always saying, be curious. Um, and, maybe prompt them to think about their own movement in a sense that maybe they should try something to squeak out 1% more potential from their movement or from their, their CrossFit, right? Um, there's always, there's not a single person that even if you think back to what you were saying, Todd, back to what you're saying about perfect movement, even if you believe 
that they could not be any be better. You know, think Julie Fouché and James Hobart in the level one training guide. It, you know, is it not a disservice to those athletes to even to just shut that completely down? Like maybe, maybe there is more potential. Be curious about that. And like, what would you, what would you change about their position to potentially explore those avenues? Right. And, and then, and then they become a part of it as well. Right. They can start to give you feedback. Oh yeah, that does kind of seem a, a little bit better. Maybe I'm going to try that for a little bit or, or, or know that that feels really off. Yeah. And so I think that's a good way to approach it. I love that concept of being curious. Like in 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 I think we can we can take that to even to what you were saying Kristen of hey, when I deal with one athlete that maybe pushes back, I don't want to make that uh the new norm and and cause mm -hmm. my interactions with future new athletes that are that have experience to 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 end up that same way. And so instead of assuming what that interaction is going to go like, oh man, I've dealt with a guy like this before when I told him to push his knees out, he rolled his eyes and didn't want to listen to me. Be curious. Huh? Last time I did this, I said this and this is what happened. I wonder what's going to happen. I this wonder. Time. This will, yeah. this will be really interesting. Yeah. Maybe if I, I wonder say it if this it'll way. happen again. Yeah. And it, it just makes the whole experience just more interesting and more yeah. fun and kind of more exciting. And instead of like you kind of putting your defenses up of, Hey, I'm going to try this. And if they roll their eyes, here's what's going to happen because that's what I expect. Instead, it's just like a, a fun kind of game of, man, I wonder how this is going to turn out. I'm going to try this. And if that doesn't work, wow, I'm going to try something else. Um, and, and, and to your point, I think a lot of this is going to, ha going to happen through the connection that we make by giving praise, asking questions, getting to know our athletes and just having confidence in, in our ability, knowing that we're an expert to some degree, regardless of how much experience we have, mm -hmm. uh, as far as coaching is concerned so. and and those those exact interactions that you've just talked about there that the one you've just described where, where even the coach doesn't 100 percent know what's going to happen it, it often those are the the situations where there's most opportunity for growth on both sides 100 mm -hmm. percent. Right? like that you, you're not going to grow as a coach unless you're willing to dive into those situations kind of kind of the unknown right and and, and even being being okay with giving a cue, maybe you give a cue that they respond to and they do, and it's worse. And, and that's not, okay. It happens not, all the time. Yeah. And not because being what sold is that? on that. That's, that's more knowledge. Yes, exactly. You now know, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Where and it's I like think so many coaches are afraid to give that little cue because they're not sure if it's going to work. So they just don't give the cue. It's like, no, just give it. And if it doesn't work, tell them to not do it anymore. Yeah, Go exactly. back to what you were doing. If no it makes it deal. worse. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You can you can be okay being wrong. And that's perfectly fine. But you've got to be mm -hmm. willing to do so. And I think you've got to have, once again, you've got to have the confidence to, to do so. It's like I remember in the early days, like I presented myself as very confident because I'd studied a lot. But deep down inside, I was very insecure because I knew I didn't know that much. And so because I had that insecurity, um, anytime that somebody pushed back on my coaching, it was like, how dare they? They don't respect me. They don't think I know what I'm talking about because deep down I knew I didn't know what I was talking about. Um, so it's a, it's a funny little game that ends up happening, right? Where uh, I think the more confident you get, the more okay you are with potentially being wrong and trying wrong. new things mm -hmm. and being curious and then just uh, leaning into that uncomfortable experience. Um, don't run away from it. I think that'd, that'd be the last thing I'd say is like, man, when you have those athletes that seem a little bit prickly and either appear not to want to be coached or aren't very receptive to things, lean into them rather than run away from them. I think to Pete's point, there's a lot of opportunity for growth there.